Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to focus upon safety and health. This is These are two terms that apply to all of us in our workplace. It doesn't matter if we work at home, we work in a factory, we work in a studio, wherever it might be, we all have to be concerned about this. My guest today is someone who deals with this every day. My guest today is Dr. Manal Azi, and Dr. Azi is a leading expert in the Occupational Safety and Health Branch of the United Nations International Labor Organization. Also, she is the coordinator for World Day for Safety and Health. Dr. Azee, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you. I appreciate you being with me. I want to flash this book, though. We're going to be talking about this in just a minute. It's the Safety and Health at the Heart of the Future of Work, Building on 100 Years of Experience. And it's a very interesting book. It's a very interesting read. And you can go to the website at www.ilo.org and probably take a look at this. But we're going to get into it in just a few minutes. But again, I want to thank you again for being with me today. Let's, let's uh, just talk in general terms. We always start off with the International Labor Organization, just in general yeah. terms. Uh, it's celebrating its 100th anniversary. And what, what is the main function of the I, I, I'm going to say ILO from yeah, now on International sure. Labor Organization. What is the main function? Yeah, Farrell, <laughs> thanks for having us here. It's quite important because it's a very important year for all of us at the ILO. Um, the ILO was founded in 1919, uh, even before the United <laughs> Nations was created. So there was a need after um, various uh, revolutions uh, to create an entity that protected the rights of workers. Um, and uh, the ILO was created and founded uh, with a mission to improve social justice in the world and to promote decent work and the, what was different about the ILO is that not only did it bring in governments to do this but also y worker representatives and unions and also employers and their organizations mm -hmm. and so whenever something is set up in the ILO um, it's usually with consensus with these three tripartite um, members uh, and that's why it's much more efficient in the workplace when the three agree uh, on what needs to be implemented mm -hmm. Um, basically, the ILO is the only uh, global normative organization that uh, develops international standards on um, labor issues. Uh, some of these standards relate to gender equality, child labor, elimination of forced labor, um, social dialogue, freedom of association, um, and non-discrimination in the area of work. But the area that we work in, specifically in our branch, is occupational safety and health. So mm -hmm. keeping work workers alive, uh, keeping <coughs> workers in good health, uh, safe from accidents is a key priority uh, to actually protect workers before having the right wages and, and the right um, uh, maternity leave and what have you, you need them to be alive. And so uh, over 40 of our conventions are uh, focused on safety and health, preventing occupational cancer, uh, preventing asbestos at work, and some of the founding recommendations of the ILO from 1919 were actually actually on anthrax, phosphorus, lead, lead poisoning in the, in the workplace and, and other occupational safety and health concerns. Mm -hmm. So that's basically <coughs> the way the organization functions. Mm -hmm. I see. Now, y you mentioned safety and health. I think, of course, I live in the United States, but in, in our country we have, in this country, let's say, we have OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, I think is what the A stands for. I may be wrong on that. But do most countries have a similar type of organization? Do they have something, some governmental entity that's looking at the safety and health in, in the occupational areas where people work? Yeah, it's good you mentioned that because it brings us to the point that not everybody as the, is at the same level of development and social mm -hmm. context and economic context. So uh, obviously many countries have that arm. Either it's a department in the ministry that only deals with safety and health or mostly enforcement, compliance and labor inspection. And some have research institutes directly linked to ministries of labor where budgets and, and investments and funding is given to such institutes to conduct training, develop publications, and support in um, uh, uh, medical surveillance and other services on occupational safety and health for enterprises. But the, the, the ILO tries to work with developing countries, countries that ha don't yet meet the minimum standards. Sometimes developed countries over exceed and you know, go beyond the minimum standards, but the ILO conventions promote a minimum, uh, minimum standards and that's why we try to uh, have the developing countries ratify uh, <laughs> these conventions and comply 
comply with their provisions. And the way they comply is that they translate our provisions into their national legislation mm -hmm. and then create the infrastructure to implement this in different workplaces. In developed countries, they may not ratify our conventions, but already implement. But we do t uh, try to have countries also who can uh, support other countries or big businesses who support smaller businesses in you know, rising up to the challenge and improving their standards on safety and health. Mm -hmm. Now, you there are f four major functions that you have. You're the yeah. chair of the Global Task Force on Waste and Environment. Is that Chemicals, right? yes. Chemicals. So currently, okay. I mean, our, our jobs change because we'll talk in a minute about the different resources available mm -hmm. and the different technology now and the changing roles everyone has. And the UN is, is not strange to these changes in the world of work. And our resources are, are changing. Um, the currently, I manage four different um, areas. So we have a global task team on chemicals, waste, and the environment. Uh, and I can speak a bit about that. Um, it's currently a huge area because we have over one million people dying because of exposure to hazardous substances, dust, and fumes at work. And we are creating international alliances and frameworks. One of the bigger ones is called SICAM. It's the strategic um, uh, framework um, for the sound management of chemicals. And it, w it had a program that led up till 2020, and we're currently reviewing the Beyond 2020 framework. Uh, key areas would be highly hazardous pesticides. Uh, and exposures to highly ha hazardous pesticides, lead in paint, um, chemicals in products like chemicals in textiles. Uh, so chemicals are everywhere. We, we, we wake up today and I think everybody uses shampoo, washes their hands, eats. Everything we do is related to chemicals. Mm -hmm. But the problem is toxic chemicals. And workers uh, who are exposed to these are exposed to long hours. And that's why their effects are huge in terms of cancer, respiratory diseases and other uh, changes in the body, be it by being exposed to solvents, to metals, mm -hmm. even in recycling, mercury, in batteries, in fluorescent lights. Uh, there are so many ways that for long hours, if you're exposed to these chemicals, it really leads to chronic diseases that we would try to prevent. So mm -hmm. that's one area of work we're trying to cover. That's very important. And, and as you mentioned, they're pervasive. And we don't yeah. even think about it so often. We're dealing with it every day. Yeah. It, it reminds me of the plastic that's in the ocean. <laughs> and exactly, the yeah. fish are dying. But so much of this plastic, I know it's a little bit off track here, but no. the, the fish ingest a lot of the chemicals from those plastics. We as humans eat Do. the fish. We ingest it. But it, it is a, it's a, a really a a pervasive cycle that touches all of our lives. What can we do, what are you doing right now to help people to avoid this type of contamination or contagion or to there, uh, have a, a negative interaction right. with chemicals that will help them lead healthier, more productive lives? So there are so many different uh, ways we can join forces to work on this. So we have an interagency task force with mm -hmm. over nine agencies called the IOMC. Uh, and we try to uh, develop various projects with various uh, focus. So for us, the most important is to develop a risk assessment a management system based on mm -hmm. risk assessment. So in different workplaces, uh, so agriculture would be different from construction where you're exposed to asbestos, which is another chemical. And so these, uh, we would l assess the risk and then uh, put in place controls uh, and we use a hierarchy of controls obviously where we start off by trying to eliminate the risk so if there's mm -hmm. a chemical that's bad for you we can um, completely eliminate it from the process if we can or then we can try to substitute it uh, and then we can do administrative controls where we could um, uh, create uh, barriers from exposure to workers and last but not least is give workers personal protective equipment to protect mm -hmm. them from these chemical exposures uh, so we follow this hierarchy of controls through a management system and do risk assessments. Another key area is globally harmonized systems for labeling. Mm -hmm. So if the world deals with you know different chemicals using the same signs, uh, workers can read what the label means, understand the danger, if it's flammable, if it's not. These are also international systems that the ILO and mm -hmm. other agencies work together to, to, to follow. Those are just two key examples, but there's so much that we do mm -hmm. in this area. Mm -hmm. This is very important too. Now the United States was, uh, was well, I'm going to say it's not always been a leader. Years ago, we had children working 60, 70 hours a week, but th we've taken care of that. But, uh, well, at present, the U.S. government, the Trump administration, is weakening our regulations in many areas to, well, not have a strict control over these 
chemical byproducts and that type of thing. Uh, do you see that movement happening in other developed, uh, economically developed countries is what I'm trying to get at. I know in some of the developing countries, it's a, a bit of a challenge, it's still a major challenge, but do you see some of the developed countries starting to weaken these labor regulations, these safety uh, regulations, the health requirements and that type of thing? I mean, it really depends. There's still um, an international community that's very clear and very active. Mm -hmm. There are lots of active NGOs and active bodies that don't allow for this level of deregulation. Also, it's about transboundary um, uh, labor uh, relationships and competitiveness in the market. So you can't, there are certain standards that are required that you can't just deregulate mm -hmm. um, uh, this area because of the toxicity, the carcinogenicity. It's not just about workers, it's about the community and the products go into groundwater, into air pollution. So um, even if in some aspects there may be some deregulation, but you know it's something that affects the world, it's that toxic, it can mm -hmm. lead to such mm -hmm. chronic um, uh, uh, outcomes, health outcomes and fatalities that uh, the scientific community, the active NGOs will not allow for an extreme level of deregulation mm -hmm. in this area. Right. What's another major area? You've got some very important areas in yeah. your office, yeah. in your branch. What What's uh, another another area I work on is the promotion of health in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, traditionally we work on protecting workers from major safety risks and, you know, but those are on the decrease. Accidents, falls from heights, slips, and et cetera, machine safety. But uh, the, the real concern today is how do we integrate health promotion and several areas into an occupational safety and health policy so that a worker today is, you know, you have proper nutrition, uh, awareness, and um, access to nutrition, you have uh, tobacco substance abuse management in the workplace, you have management of stress in the workplace and the prevention of psychosocial risks, the prevention of violence and harassment, which is now you know, a big issue. Um, so we, in this program, we try to integrate all these health promotion issues from a workplace perspective, where we set policies in the workplace to allow for workers to take breaks, to allow for non-excessive working hours, to allow access in nutrition in, in cafeterias to food because you've got countries in the world where you know there's no time to rest there's no place to sit to eat and if you don't eat properly or have access to this kind of water and you know um, clean water also um, you're prone to accidents you know the you're not concentrating uh, well enough and your body is weak you have mental fatigue and the right there's a rise in accidents so the link is quite clear and the prevention of these non communicable diseases like cardiovascular disease hypertension diabetes mm -hmm. can only happen if in the workplace we create an environment that promotes health so you know places where you can exercise physical activity sleep well and, and protect your health as a whole. Because today, you know, the workplace is everywhere. We work from home, we work in the car, in the train, uh, in the car if we're driven, um, uh, in planes, uh, yeah, <laughs> not <Right>. while driving. <laughs> um, so we're working everywhere. We have internet, we have access to data everywhere. So um, that you can't separate your life and home and work from each other. So the work has a duty today, a responsibility to support health rather than, you know, um, deteriorate your health mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, uh, that's one area th another uh, yeah that's very good yeah <laughs> that's excellent <laughs> glad well you're watching global connections television which is a privately funded independently produced program the opinions expressed on global connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests we would invite our viewers to go to our website at www Global Connections Television to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or Community Access Television Station, or you are involved with an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just like our program, you have a website and you want to share it, or you just have a computer and you want to share it, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're taking a look at the, uh, the whole area of occupational safety and health and all of the implications that come with it. My guest today is an expert on this particular topic. My guest today is Dr. Malal Azee, and she heads up the uh, safety and health branch in the United Nations International Labor Organization. 
Doctor, I see this is really a major issue, and it's one that affects everybody. I think we're all affected somewhere. Even if we live in the, Amazon, in the headwaters of the Amazon, to some degree, we're going to have some type of chemical interaction with climate change, air pollution, that type of thing. Uh, you, uh, what, what is, uh, uh, you were going to start something. I'm sorry, I yeah. cut you off a minute. No, ago. Why I don't mean, you it's, it's good to it mention. Up from there? You mentioned that, that, you know, uh -huh. the people work everywhere, and, you know, mm -hmm. informal economy is also huge. And so one of the other projects we head up is the um, improvement of safety and health in small medium enterprises now these are enterprises that are small they say you know we don't have the budget to create a management system on safety and health we don't have the budget to employ a safety and health specialist so how do you help these people that are remotely placed they're usually you know family farmers uh, in agricultural fields in remote areas they have no access to any support and and so this project we're looking um, we're, we're building up is to review what are some sustainable delivery mechanisms to um, improve safety and health in these areas and we found that one it needs to talk the business talk so you can't come and say okay mm -hmm. here you have a business system a management system and now we want you to build a parallel one that's on OSH. OSH should be part of your business so you can't have business without having running it safely um, and, and so that's one thing we found another thing is budget so governments need to assign and support and create incentives, financial incentives, it could be tax incentives or other, mm -hmm. um, so that people have what it takes to be trained on safety and health uh, at no cost and, and reach out to um, people in s very small, micro, small, medium enterprises. Another issue is to have the a network of intermediaries. It could be loan officers who provide loans to these companies who are trained on safety and health and it's a win-win situation. So if your, your workers are safe and healthy, you increase productivity, mm -hmm. you pay your loan back, for example. So there are so many ways where uh, we can support really micro, small, medium enterprises enterprises in improving the safety health of, the, of their workers. That's very important. Uh, can you think of one specific one, you don't have to name the group, yeah. but can you think of one, maybe a logging business or a, a computer operation, small and medium sized enterprise that that uh, you're referencing here? Uh, I mean, there are uh, several. So in the project we're covering in every, we're covering six different countries researching. Mm -hmm. We have even gold, uh, small scale gold mining, for example, oh, in really? the Philippines. Yeah, we have manufacturing, a lot of manufacturing of clothes and textiles that could be small uh, companies. Artisanal uh, is another one. Uh, the cocoa industry, uh, the different food production uh, processes. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, I mean, uh, there's even small construction sites. These are really uh, hazardous because they subcontract. We don't know who uh, who's responsible for who if an accident happens. Those small um, businesses uh, cre you know, have normally more hazards than other uh, businesses, but just sometimes have a high turnover of workers, and they accept that as this is the way we have to live. We lose our lives, but you know, we have a job, we get paid. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the culture and thinking that we're trying to change. Mm -hmm. Now at the opening we referenced the safety and health at the heart of the future of work building on 100 years of experience. What what were some of the recommendations that came out of this publication, some of the highlights? This was just recently done. It's literally right. hot off the press, yeah, is it not? Exactly. It is. So, I mean, every year we, uh, the ILO uh, c celebrates the World mm -hmm. Day for Safety and Health at Work. It's every 28th April. And we try to choose a topic or a theme that's quite uh, timely. Uh, and we have offices around the world. We have our member states around the world that also join in promoting and, and talking about this issue. Uh, this year, because it's the ILO 100th centenary and uh, because there's a huge discussion on, on the future of work and the changes mm -hmm. in the future of work and the major mega trends, we decided to shed light on how these mega trends are affecting safety and health. And so this report looks into the different areas of technology, robotics, automation, and uh, nanotechnology and other areas of digitalization and how they affect safety and health. It also looks at demographics. So you've got a younger workforce entering the market. You've also got uh, increased life expectancy. So you can find older people working, and then they have their own risks that we need to consider. Another area is climate change and how heat stress and workers who uh, are exposed to increased heat stress are uh, experiencing more and more accidents and more and more diseases. So 
that's another area we're looking at, including green technology and how mm -hmm. renewable energy and other recycling are not only solving problems, but maybe introducing new risks that we didn't know about. And the fourth mega trend we look at is the work organization has changed. So more non-standard forms of employment, flexible hours, uh, platform economy, and other um, work organization changes uh, seem to be giving the world uh, a flexibility and an aut uh, autonomy, uh, but at the same time creating new risks because mm -hmm. of the less control we have on, on managing the, the working environment and others. And obviously technology brings with it other ethical issues. So there are huge mega trends with opportunities and challenges. The, the ILO um, is looking to respond to these challenges through six major um, areas, I would say, by anticipating risk, by being more multidisciplinary. So it's not about just, you know, occupational safety and health experts doing the work. It's, you know, collaborating with human resources to tackle psychosocial risks. It's collaborating with sociologists, lawyers, and other experts and, and technology experts so that um, we can answer uh, through the design phase, include controls that would protect workers and anticipate risk and also uh, we want to you know talk, work more with the public health mm -hmm. strategies because yeah. we said the worker now works everywhere so we're trying to look at different outcomes uh, measuring exposure at the workplace to noise for example and the outcome of cardiovascular disease uh, measuring excessive working hours we know that 36 percent of the world today works more than 48 hours a week which is much more than before so how can we um, protect uh, workers? And these excessive hours are linked to stroke, um, increased uh, uh, rates of depression, anxiety, and um, addictive behaviors. So we're looking at new links between new exposures uh, and health outcomes attributable to work. Uh, further to that, we look back at our conventions that although some are not very recent, they still have provisions that are very timeless, like you know asking employers to keep up to date with scientific data, looking into not only physical health but mental health and fatigue, mm -hmm. looking into worker organization rest and working hours. These are provisions that already provide for protections in our conventions. And, and the last thing we are um, calling for is expanding partnerships. So not only do we work with workers, employers and governments, but we should now work more closely with the private sector, mm -hmm. which is a powerful um, <coughs> um, body, and with civil society, which can also you know, speak the language of the people um, that are most affected. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly sounds like, well, these are very complex areas. They're interrelated, but they're, you're taking a holistic approach. You're right. looking at it from the macro standpoint to right. see every particular aspect that could have any type of influence in this whole uh, situation that, uh, that we're talking about. You mentioned number three. Well, all four were very important, but number yeah. three really got my attention because of climate change. Yep. Many, many scientists believe that's our number one problem. We can see the climate's changing. I, I don't have to go into the litany yeah. of what's happening, yeah. but it is, and it's getting worse, and we're losing yeah. ground, it seems like. Uh, what are we doing, or what are you doing, I should say, yeah. to try to focus attention on climate change to help people better understand this issue and how dire it is right now, and how we really, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN IPCC, that we only have about 12 years to maybe t not stop it, but slow it down or uh, hopefully to yeah. have some positive impact on it. So what in the last minute, the hardest question, yeah, sure. what can you do no, with that? No, I mean, it's estimated that the, the temperature is going to increase by 1.5 degrees mm -hmm. within the next century, and that's going to cause a loss of uh, over 72 million jaw hours of work uh, between now and 2030, which is huge mm -hmm. for the market. And it's the, the place of work is one of the biggest places where emissions are made, be it for air pollution, indoor air pollution, outdoor air pollution, and, and, and water pollution. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a responsibility in the world of work to prevent uh, effects and our carbon footprint and others that are leading to this climate change. At the same time, uh, d the practices in the workplace are affecting closely the workers and their safety and health to start with. And so we have new um, uh, recommendations, discussions, and a global legal frameworks that we are developing to protect workers mainly and to uh, 
uh, have the world of work play a more active role in preventing the increase in these changes in, the, in, in climate. But we have to focus on, on one area, and that would be our comparative advantage, not forgetting the emergency response workers that are even more affected uh, mm -hmm. by this uh, climate change uh, and the heat stress that comes with it, and the increased uh, allergies, kidney failures, and, and different diseases that are uh, that could have affected you in a minor way now are affecting a bigger way due to this um, accumulating effect uh, when, when you're exposed to heat. So we've got huge programs now in countries like uh, Qatar, for example, which will host the championships soon and the construction work going on there and uh, and heat stress and then the it taps into the migrant worker issue and we're trying to up uh, their um, normative standards in order to protect workers uh, in view of these changes at the same time decrease the footprint so we have a green jobs for example um, uh, program uh, that I I promotes green technology uh, that we talked about but that we we hope that this green technology would not bring more risks with it so we need to be <laughs> careful to look at the all the you know exactly. the, from all angles. See what yeah. the, see what the re repercussions are going to be. Well, yeah. Dr. Manala, see this is an extremely important area, and I'm really looking forward to reading your study. But I want to thank you so very much for a thank very you. interesting and a very informative program. Thank you, thank Th you so much. Thank you. I am Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.